just sit right back and hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started from this tropic port aboard this tiny ship. that energy and uh, man Sean said it last week it's like that perfect walk-up music I feel like I'm a baseball player coming in to relieve the starting pitcher you know I'm I got the the setup was great and now the save is coming in right and so uh, man I'm excited to be here with you all today uh, my name is Pastor Joel for those of you who don't know who I am I get to serve here as our executive pastor and this morning uh, my mic is a little hot. I can hear it, and the guys are on that because they're amazing. Can you just give it up real quick for our tech team in the back? The most underappreciated job. Thank you, guys. Uh, man, you three teenage boys, pay attention. Um, anyway, uh, we've been in this series of Jonah for two weeks now. We're on week three, and today we get to walk through chapter three of Jonah uh, but week one started, and uh, Pastor Tony shared with us how Jonah was unsure. He didn't know the call that he had. He was unsure of it. He, he felt uneasy with it. See, Jonah wasn't too sure of the job that God had given to him to proclaim this coming judgment to Nineveh. And Jonah was also unsure due to the actions and the violence that the people of Nineveh were known for. And then last week, Pastor Sean walked us through what it means to be uncomfortable and how even in our Christian walk, it's okay for us to be uncomfortable, but the thing is we can't be uncompromising in our beliefs. We have to stay and stand firm and walk with the Lord even when we are not comfortable. And today we get to look at Jonah and this series we've been talking about the uns in life. You know, we're unsure, we're uncomfortable, and today we're talking about what it means to be unequipped. And uh, next week we'll get to the fourth un, but as I was doing some research getting ready for today, uh, I was looking up what are, what are the things people feel unequipped for? Um, and the number one result that came up, the most studies that have been done, have been around graduating college students. And are they prepared or are they equipped for the professional world? And what's interesting is uh, one of the things I found is that an overwhelming majority of students graduating college do not feel equipped for the professional world. Actually, 74% of them say they are not ready. They don't feel ready to enter into the professional world. And uh, another study I was looking at, it was after this past school year, a survey was done to see how many parents felt equipped to do at-home learning for the 2021-2022 school year. And what was interesting is that 82% of parents said they were not ready for at-home learning again. I think really they were just done with it. They were like, I love my kids, but you all need to take them. Another survey I was looking at said that 63% of moms who have adult children living at home do not believe their adult children are ready to go live on their own. They, they need to keep them at home because they're not prepared for life. You know, by a show of hands, how many parents do we have in the room? Parents here today. Now, you guys can put your hands down. How many of you felt ready or equipped to have your children you're like four. What are you, no, I'm just kidding. You're like six back there. What do you raise your hand for at the kids' table? Nobody in the room raised their hand, by the way. Oh, Julie, okay. One raised their hand saying that they are ready. They were equipped to have their child. See, I believe that there is a multitude of things that we feel unequipped for in our life. You know, it could be from our job, it could be to having kids, it could be, are we equipped, are we ready for retirement, are we ready to buy a house, are we ready to buy a car? There's so many things that we're not equipped for. I have kids back there, one of the biggest things that they don't feel ready for or equipped for to handle is transitions from elementary school to middle school to high school. And we know that college students are not ready for the real world. There's so much that we don't know how to handle their face, but the reality is we have to. We all feel unequipped to some extent. And in the realm of our Christian walk, there's probably a lot of us here that don't feel equipped to share our faith. 
Actually, I was doing research just on this subject alone, and I found LifeWay did an amazing study on it, if you're interested in it. LifeWay Research has some great studies about how people feel equipped or don't and what to say to that. Um, but it, LifeWay Research says that 80% of churchgoers believe that they have the mission, it is their responsibility and their job to share their faith. 80% of people that go to church believe that they are supposed to share their faith. However, 61% of those people have never once shared Jesus with somebody. 48% of regular church attenders have never invited an unchurched person to church. So 80% of people believe that they are responsible for sharing Jesus with others. But what stops us? You know, maybe it is we are unsure. Maybe it is we're very uncomfortable. Or maybe we just feel unequipped. Today we're going to be looking in Jonah, and, and we're going to be looking in Jonah 3, and I'll say this now and I'll explain it later. You, on your notes, it's just a mess. Like, look on the back of the sermon notes. I, I'll explain that later. It says chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, something like that. Uh, I'll explain that later, but we're actually going to be just sitting in Jonah chapter 3 today. And when we read through Jonah chapter 3, we're going to see how God works in and through the unequipped. Jonah works in or God works in and through the unequipped. And so before we do that, I just want to give you a quick recap, a quick rundown of Jonah so far, okay? So Jonah 1 starts with God giving Jonah this mission. He says, I need you to go to Nineveh. I need you to preach the gospel to them. I need you to, to give them this warning that judgment is coming. And there's not really any explanation needed for this mission. It's pretty straightforward and clear. But what happens is Jonah then is unwilling to go. See, in his wisdom, he does, the act, the, he does the direct opposite of what he wants to do, of what he's made to do, what he's supposed to do. He actually runs and is disobedient from God. He goes the complete opposite way. You know, the people of Nineveh are sinful, they're violent, he wants nothing to do with them, so Jonah is unwilling to go. And what happens is Jonah actually boards this boat in Joppa, and he gets on it, and all of a sudden there's this huge storm that rolls in. A huge storm rolls in, and what happens is Jonah is actually asleep in the bottom of the boat. And all the other men, uh, the sailors are there. They're praying on the boat. They're, they're asking, you know, whose God is the one responsible for this? What is happening? And, and Jonah is just asleep. And then finally they go down, and they ask him, and he explains that, you know, I'm running from God. God gave me a mission, and I'm running from God. And they casted lots to figure this out. And Jonah tells them who he is. He says, I'm a Hebrew, and the God I serve is the God of the universe. You know, he's the God that created the heaven. He's the God that created the sea. He is the one true God. And what he does is he tells him to throw him into the water. Throw me into the storm, and it'll calm down for you. And so they do. The men throw Jonah into the storm. And from there, we see that the storm slows down. The men repent, they're saved, they, they turn to the Lord. Uh, this is probably the worst evangelistic strategy in the history of the Bible, <laughs> like to completely run away and to be thrown into the water. It's not one I would recommend you follow, but if you want to, go for it. Um, and then we get to Jonah chapter 2. In Jonah chapter 2, there's this big fish that comes, and it, it's provided for Jonah, swallows him up. And in Jonah 2, we see this prayer of Jonah's. But what we noticed that Pastor Sean walked us through last week is that there was no repentance for his disobedience in his prayer. There's nothing that suggested Jonah was at fault. Nothing that, that said, it's, it's my bad. There's nothing that says, Lord, I need you to forgive me. But what he does say, which is interesting, is that he says, I know that you are the God who saves, and I'm willing to fulfill my vow to you. And, and I believe this is a dynamic that is very weird, and, and it plays at Jonah's heart a lot. It's like he knows what the truth is, 
He knows the path he's supposed to take. Jonah has all of the knowledge. He was a Hebrew boy, bought, brought up more than likely in the, in the school. He knew all of the word of the Lord, and, and yet it still hasn't penetrated his heart. You know, there's this arrogance there. There's a pride that says, God, I know you can save people, but I'm not the one that needs saving. I think this is at play in, in even some of us. And then Jonah finally gets put in Nineveh. He ends up in Nineveh. He spit out of the fish, and then now we get to chapter 3, where God gives Jonah his mission one more time. He says, go to Nineveh and proclaim the message I give you. And Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went to Nineveh. So Jonah's there, and he's in Nineveh, and this time in chapter 3, we see that Jonah obeyed. Jonah actually obeys. He goes and he preaches. Finally, he's obedient in chapter 3. And what is so interesting here in, in Jonah and in, in this message that, that we have in, in Jonah 3 is that there is a very powerful movement that actually happens in Nineveh. In this city of wicked, sinful people, we see this movement come in and it takes them over and we see the word of the Lord proclaimed and it's powerful. People begin to repent. And this is what I notice is that in Nineveh, it actually started with the ordinary, everyday people. It wasn't all about the highest of highs there. It was the, the word of the Lord moving through, through the streets in Nineveh. And then finally, it reaches the king. It went from the least to the most powerful in Nineveh. And when I think about how many times I myself feel unequipped, when, when I think about how I'm not enough, you know, there's so many times I'm reminded in Scripture that God works in and through the unequipped. To be honest with you, uh, this week was a very odd week. Um, I felt so unequipped to share with you all this morning. It was one of those weeks where um, I really could not figure out what to say. And for those of you that don't know, I actually am a person of routine. So I love my routine, especially when it comes to message preparation. I, I need to prepare my messages in the same way. And it takes a lot for me to get off of my routine and my schedule. And this week, I was working so hard. This past month, I've been working so hard trying to, to know what God is saying. And um, I just felt unequipped felt like I wasn't ready. I didn't know what to say. And the reality is I really feel unequipped all the time. It was actually three years ago this week that I was introduced on this stage uh, as the next-gen pastor here at Crossway. And I remember it was one of the most scariest times of my life to, to be sitting on this stage introduced to a church where I didn't really know anybody. And I didn't have any family here uh, in Pennsylvania. And I honestly felt like I wasn't ready I wasn't going to be able to do what you, the church, were asking of me and what God was asking of me. You know, there was a ton of doubts. I didn't feel like I had all the answers. I didn't feel like I had all the necessary skills that I needed. In fact, to this day, I still have these moments where I feel like I'm not enough. Anybody feel the same? And now I don't say this all to you so you come up to me after the service. And give me, oh, Pastor Joel, you're so great. We love you. I appreciate that. I know you guys love me, but I just, I just want to be real with you. Because there are so many days where I don't feel equipped. I don't feel enough. I don't feel ready. And this week was for sure one of them. See, there's a multitude of days where I, where I feel like I'm not ready, I'm not equipped to do what God has called me to do. But the truth is, I don't have to be equipped to do what God has called me to do. I just need Jesus. I don't need to know it all. I don't need to have all of the answers. I don't need to be unafraid. I just need Jesus. And I need to spend time with him. And this is something that I've been feeling convicted of more and more lately, of how much time am I truly spending with Jesus because our days are busy. And, and it, it gets hard. Now, I've been doing this for the better part of a year. How much time am I trying to put away and spend with just the Lord? And what was interesting is this past month, the past couple weeks, 
even, I've, I feel like I've been forced to spend time alone just with Jesus, especially when I was preparing for this message. You know, like I said earlier, I stick to my routine, and I'll just give you a little glimpse into what it looks like. So a month out, typically, Pastor Tony and I will sit down and we'll talk through the sermon series we're in and the goals for it and, and kind of the direction we're heading. And then I get my specific week that I get to speak to, to you all. And um, from that moment on, I start to pray. I, ju I just ask God, I said, God, what is it you need me to say? And Lord, help me to be the servant that you ask me to be. So that's my prayer. God, what is it you need me to say and help me to be the servant you ask me to be? I read through uh, the passages multiple times. I, I sit and pray over them, and, and I look to write things down as they stick out to me. I highlight. I do all of that. And, and then two weeks out, I, I keep praying. I keep praying. I keep praying. And, and that's like I just focus in like, okay, what is it I need to learn from this? And then the week of when I get ready to speak, I typically come in on a Monday, and I write out all of my thoughts that are in my head, everything down. And then from there, I tweak, and we end up with a result. And it's constantly prayed over. It's constantly looked at by multiple times. But this week, this time it was different. You know, I had two weeks out, I just kept praying and praying, and it was one of those moments where I was like, God, where are you? God, why are you silent? And then Monday came, and I sat at my computer and I've been praying and asking God, what is it you want me to say? What is it you want me to write down? And after I left on Monday, I had a blank paper. Tuesday came, and I had nothing written down. That's why you don't have an outline. I know Linda came up and, and said she loves to guess the fill-in-the-blanks before the service to see, if, to see if she's right. And she was a little upset that two weeks in a row, Sean and I disappointed, and uh, we didn't give her blanks to fill in. And so... Pastor Tony, I know you're probably watching online, have blanks next week just for Linda, uh, or you're going to hear it. Um, yeah, that's, that's why you don't have an outline. Our outlines are typically due on Tuesday at noon, and uh, you don't have an outline because I had absolutely nothing written down. I was like, God, I don't know what you're saying. I don't know what you're doing, but God, I, I'm just asking for, for you to move. Wednesday came, and I went to Susan finally. I said, Susan, I need your help. Like, help me please. And I asked her, I was like, read through Jonah 3 and tell me what you see. Tell me what you hear. And honestly, we were digging and we found nothing. Like, we, yeah, we had nothing. And then I left on Wednesday. I, I normally would have stayed late and just stuck it out and, and tried to get it done. But uh, I had to leave. And then we came back and we had an outpost worship night. And one of the things we did uh, during the worship night was we had a time where we just listened to God. It was no talking, no worship, just nothing. We were sitting, listening, and praying to the Lord. I'd love to tell you that on that Wednesday night this week, that something came to me, but it didn't. So I walk in Thursday, feeling defeated, feeling like I have the un inability to think, feeling totally unequipped, and that's where it finally started to click where it finally all came together. And it was revealed to me that that's where God works, is in the unequipped, the ordinary, the everyday people. You don't have to be the best. You don't have to have all the answers. You just need to search and seek and seek. And I promise you, you will find. And what I was looking for was I was looking for Jonah specifically. Like, how is Jonah feeling unequipped? And the reality is I never found that about Jonah. But what God showed me is that it was actually in the people of Nineveh who were the ones that are unequipped. They were f sinful people. They were lost. They were broken, like all of us. But yet God had a powerful movement in and through them, and it changed the lives of a whole city. And so I want to read through that story today. I want, to, I want to read about this great big city that was saved because of normal people, because of shopkeepers, store merchants, the working class. They took the warning of the Lord seriously. And they listened. And they repented. See, God did such a powerful work in them that it went through them to all of the people next to them. And so this is what we're going to read uh, in Jonah 3, 3 through 6. It says this. It says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. 
Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, they put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robe, covered himself in sackcloth, sat down in the dust. And this is the proclamation that he issued in Nineveh. He said, by decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people, animals, Herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered in sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, He relented, and he did not bring on them the destruction that was threatened. This movement started with the people, and it reaches the king. The movement was so powerful that it saved them from their destruction. And it was all coming because of their own wickedness. Can you imagine with me, just for a moment, just imagine with me, what this would look like today for us? For the everyday, ordinary people to begin to follow the Lord. For us to repent. And for the leaders of not just our country, but what if the leaders of this world called for all of us to fast and turn to the Lord? Could you imagine that? How powerful that would be? See, I see the kids that are in the back table there. And I think about how they have the same power in them. There's no junior Holy Spirit church. And how they have the same power in them to change their families. They have the power to change their own lives. I I think of the youth that, that some of them are in here today. And I think of how they have the power, they have the ability to start praying for the school their schools, how they can change their lives of the students that are around them, how they can stop walking around and carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders because in middle and high school, it feels like every problem is the biggest problem in the world. Can you imagine if they started to share Jesus with one another? Can you imagine what it would look like for your workplace to be transformed by a movement of Jesus? If we truly lived out what we said we believed. Pastor Sean shared with us one time while leading worship in youth. And it's a line that's stuck with me ever since, and it was some words of wisdom that he got from his dad. And his dad told him one of the easiest lies that we tell is when we sing a song in worship and we don't mean it. See, do you mean the words that you sing on a Sunday? When you sing the words, here's my heart, Lord, do you truly surrender to him? Do you believe that God is actually good? Do we really have the faith to change our actual behavior and follow him fully? Do we actually believe that we can go and preach in our workplaces? And we can see not just our place of work change, but we can see a community cared for. We can see people start to feel the real love of Jesus. We can see households restored. We can see schools become houses of prayer. Or do we feel like we're all unequipped, we're all unqualified, and like we just can't do it? See, here's the truth. This is what I've been resonating with this week. We probably won't ever feel like we're equipped. But instead of running from it, you know what we need to do? We have to embrace our brokenness in our humanity. Because then we become more reliant and dependent on the Holy Spirit to work in and through us. See, our feelings of weakness should be the feelings that drive us to our knees in prayer. It should be the feeling that, that we need a God in all of the power that he has. Our weakness should allow us to trust in God's power even more. Movements don't start, especially movements of the Lord, don't start with the most qualified candidate. 
but I don't start with the one who has it all together. It doesn't start with the one who has all the answers. It starts with people embracing who they are and how they're broken and how they need Jesus. It starts with us on our knees in prayer, crying out for God to save us. See, we won't ever be equipped, but the truth is that having Jesus is more than enough. Jesus is more than enough. He's enough to cover all of our shortcomings. He's enough to cover all of our weaknesses. He's what we need to share with others. If you don't know what to share when you're sharing your faith, share Jesus. Share what he did on the cross, how he rose again, and he was the perfect atonement and sacrifice for our sins. And because of that, we're forgiven and free. And we now can walk faithfully with him. See, in order to see a movement like the one that started in Nineveh, it starts with God doing a work in us. See, we have to do the work ourselves, and we have to spend time with the Lord daily. Embracing the fact that we aren't enough, but Jesus is. See, if sharing your faith means being ready, if it means having it all together, having all the answers, not being fearful, nobody would ever be able to share their faith. But anyone who knows Jesus and knows the gospel is ready. All we need to do is share who Jesus is. We need to know what he's done for us. And that's it. My challenge for you this week is that I hope that you spend time with Jesus so that he becomes so real and so lovely that you can't help but share what he's done in your life with the people around you.